I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here in person. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Kate, my, one of my number one supporters in the Aww. city. Always appreciate you, fam. Uh, it's good to be in person. I see a couple of familiar faces. Y'all probably don't think I'm familiar because I, I cut my beard off. So many of you might not recognize me, uh, this handsome young looking man when, when I was walking through. All right, cool. So I got a pretty cool talk uh, that uh, I think is a cool talk. And I think this talk is super important because I think this talk is kind of like the future of where we're going in security for the next couple of years. I think that there's going to be a couple of people in here that if, if uh, there's going to be some skeptics in here. Uh, I'm a skeptical son of a gun myself, uh, you know, because I mean, I think that part of the, the whole cyber community, community, cyber security and hacker community and people has been looking at applications forever and, and the nature of our job is to be skeptical. And I'm super skeptical. However, I think that, that all this stuff, I've been a skeptic on blockchain, crypto, cryptocurrencies. Uh, I just got into smart contracts and, and researching them. Uh, and also, I'm actually, that's the art I drew for my, I'm doing an NFT collection, funny enough. Uh, so uh, that's my art. <laughs> and, uh, and so the reason why I got into it, uh, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite like uh, self-help type motivational guy, I'm a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk. Anybody like Gary V in here? Yes or no? A couple of people like Gary V. Uh, some people hate him. Maybe some people hate me. Some people love me. Same thing. So I identify with him a lot. Um, but anyway, he was talking about how you could raise money for nonprofits and all that stuff. And, and you could do all kinds of different uh, uses of NFTs. When I was growing up, I was actually an artist, and I, I, I used to draw a lot. I wanted to be an architect when I was young. Uh, and then, like, I found out that, oh, you, need, you actually got to go to college and pay for school and all that stuff to be an architect. And, and, uh, and I, was, I was born, like, super poor. I'm from Marlin, Texas. Anybody been to Marlin in here? A couple people? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm from this small little town. So there's no way in heck I was going to be able to go to college to be an architect. However, I had a second love. Ever since I saw War Games, I wanted to get into computers, and, and that's my favorite hacker movie of all time. I didn't know that was a hacker movie when I was young. But ever since I, is that some feedback? No? All right, cool. All right, so ever since I was young, I was like, hey, I want to work in computers, and I love art. And so uh, this is actually pretty funny because the whole, this NFT and then blockchain, when I was 18 years old, I went to the military. And in the military, I did cryptography. I, did, I was in the US Navy. I did cryptography, signals intelligence, and all kinds of stuff. If I told you what I did in the military, I had to kill everybody in the room, and we're not trying to have no violence out here. So this is a little bit of my background. Um, so I'm a, tech, I'm a tech entrepreneur about six, seven years ago, or 2014. I don't even know. I lost count. Uh, I started a company, uh, many, many people that know me. Uh, I sold this company two years ago, uh, and I sold it to this company called ReliQuest, and I currently work uh, for ReliQuest. I do all kind of research. Uh, I, end up, I write a lot of malware now. Uh, my, my day job is writing like ransomware and trying to bypass stuff and all kind of cool stuff. So I'm doing a lot of code. So it's a cool departure from where I was before, what I was doing. As, as a CEO of my own company, I, it was a lot of sales and marketing and stuff. Now I'm back to the grind where I just write code all the time and I'm back on my grind and I'm, I'm hacking. Uh, so I was in the Navy eight years. Again, intelligence community stuff. I, I was actually very technical at NSA uh, and I was the first member in the military on a couple of different teams. So I'm really fortunate to have the, the, the background that I have. Uh, also, I, did, I, have, I, have, I have patents in cryptography. Um, I've done some pretty cool stuff regarding cryptography and cybersecurity. I have patents in those things. I'm also an author. Uh, people, some people may know that we did the Tribe of Hackers series. Uh, we did four books, Tribe of Hackers. And then at the beginning of the pandemic, what I did is I wrote two children's books and illustrated them. So the whole, the whole art thing has always been a part of my life. The cryptography, funny enough, has been a part of my life, and there's definitely a lot of cryptography in the crypto space and all that. And so I was like, well, I want to do some, I want to see if I can do some art and, I, and see if I can sell it and, and see if I can help people out. So that's, the, that's what got me like deep down this rabbit hole. 
And actually, my, my, my boss, I work for the CTO of LockQuest, he said, hey, look, people are asking about blockchain security. And so this is like a culmination of everything coming together. Uh, so how many of y'all work in uh, any blockchain people in here? Anybody done serious work on it? I have a couple people. So forgive me if I'm, I'm going to say a lot of stuff wrong here. <laughs> and so have patience with me. Uh, I'm just, I just tell people I'm just a dumb country boy trying to figure stuff out. So if, if I say anything wrong, wait to the end and correct me and I'll make sure that we correct them. If I'm like blatantly wrong, all right? Don't, don't be ticky tack with me, you know what I'm saying? But hopefully everybody in here, blockchain is the future 100%. And, and as security professionals, we need to understand how smart contracts work. We need to understand what languages are being used. We need to understand the form that these things are being used in. And this will be a good primer I think some of y'all are going to go, and hopefully, if y'all do stuff based on, you know, this is going to be a primer for some people. Is this your first time, like, trying to take a deep dive into this, yes or no? Anybody? You can raise your hand. Yeah, cool, a couple people. Y'all scared to raise your hand in front of all these smart people, I understand. So this is going to be a dive, and I'm going to give you the resources you need to continue. Uh, that's kind of like what I do. I'm like this, I'm a stunt man, pretty much. I do all these crazy stuff, research, and then I give it to everybody else. And y'all going to do way more with this stuff than, I, than I'm going to do, probably. So uh, in the future, if you're like, oh, snap, that talk helped me or whatever, let me know. Because I, like I always like to get that feedback if I'm hitting on the right thing. Uh, I think this is going to be pretty, pretty cool. So you're going to hopefully some people learn something new. And my, my thing is, if I learn one thing that I can use, I'm happy when I see a talk. So uh, if I, if I say, if you don't learn nothing from this talk, please tell me that too. You're like, Marcus, you should have just kept that in the can. All right, cool. Let's go. All right, y'all heard this announcement today. Facebook changed its name to Meta. Yeah, Facebook changed its name to Meta. Now, the things that we talked about, blockchain and all that stuff. So this is Mark Zuckerberg announced this today. This is not a joke. This is serious. So basically, uh, Facebook changed their name, and they're saying, hey, what we're trying to do is focus on this metaverse. Now, the metaverse contains a lot of stuff. Mainly, uh, most people would say that AR, VR, all this other stuff, you know, they bought Oculus. They've dabbled around in cryptocurrency. Uh, uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, uh, cryptocurrency, um, NFTs is a big part right now in the metaverse. So all this stuff is a part of this metaverse. And so Facebook is like, look, we're going to own this space. They, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is saying, we're going to own this metaverse. Now, if you actually go to Facebook.com or, or you can just search meta if you don't believe me, he changed the name today and he's like, we're going to own this space. So they own meta.com. So I don't know how soon this transition is going to happen. But what Facebook said is like, all the people that are, are using uh, our platform are, is an older generation, and they're trying, to mod they're trying to modernize, and they're trying to embrace this decentralization. So this right now, this is a big day, and remember this day uh, for the next couple of years. Because I think that what's going to happen is everybody else is going to follow suit quickly. So everybody, and you probably work for a company that's dabbling around in this. I know that we have a lot of gaming companies, have a lot of high tech companies. This whole metaverse thing is here to stay, and we, we have to understand uh, some of these things. And hopefully, if you don't know it before, I'll, hopefully I'll give you some tools to, to research. So actually, I'm changing the name of this to Hagger's Guide to the Metaverse. So that's where we're going to talk about this real quick. The metaverse means something different to everybody, too, by the way. It's not, there's not one metaverse. It's like the internet. There's a bunch of metaverses. You know, here are metaverse, there everywhere, everywhere are metaverse. All right, what, what, so um, again, there's a, there's a lot of different kind of metaverses. This right here, anybody read this paper before? I don't think, I don't see no people saying, yeah, I've seen it. Like this paper right here will give you a primer. Read this paper. This is mandatory reading. This is your homework assignment. This right here, uh, it says security aspects of a distributed ledger technologies. Read this, you gotta read this. It's really good, really well written. It talks about a lot of, it talks about some of the things that I'm about to talk about. Uh, and it talks about it way more in depth than I could give it justice for. 
Is there anybody uh, keeping track of time? Because I talk a lot. So how much time I got? I'm a, I, all the way to the top of the hour or 40? All right, appreciate you. See, you. number one, my number one support in Austin, except for my wife. Don't let my wife hear, hear that. <laughs> All right, so this book right here is, um, I mean, this, this is an 80-something page guide, and it walks through uh, everything. So it, it talks about Bitcoin. Bitcoin, of course, is the first, pretty much the first uh, publicly used cryptocurrency, but I found research that cryptocurrencies I found newspaper articles back in the 80s talking about cryptocurrencies. The first time I saw cryptocurrency written in the newspaper, it was uh, talking about a, they were trying to do a, a European standard cryptocurrency so they could, so in Europe, this is before the Euro. So the Euro is, the, is kind of like the, the, what came out of all that discussion. A, like a centralized little currency but they didn't make it into a cryptocurrency. So, to, so from what I read myself, and this is way back when John Major was the prime minister of, of the UK, and, I, and it's pretty interesting. Uh, so uh, it's this, this thing called newspapers.com. I actually do crazy, like, I mean, some of y'all OSINT people will probably use that before too, newspaper.com. I'm like, like, when's the first time people talking about cryptocurrency? And, it, and I found it like it was in the 80s when John Major was prime minister. This paper right here is so freaking dope, and it's going to get you up to speed, and it's going to send you down the rabbit hole that I've been. All right, so distributed ledger technology is like the proper name for it, uh, and I think block, blockchain and, di and distributed ledger technology is the same thing. Would anybody agree? I got a blockchain expert. Is that okay? That's okay. I'm not messing up yet so far. Tell me, hey, you can raise your hand and say, Marcus, that's not right, and you can correct me so we can get everybody on the same page. All right, so this is the same, so DLT, distributed ledger technology. So basically you have these ledgers that are, are, are replicated all over the world. Uh, they're, they're, people call them miners, and those miners, they actually make money to participate in this distributed uh, network. There's nodes all over the place. Some of y'all might have your own crypto miners. They are taking part, and so those miners have a copy of the ledger. So it's like a big database and everybody has a copy of it. And everybody replicates and everybody agrees that the data is the data. Now, in cybersecurity, uh, the term that we use for that is, uh, we, there's two terms that we could use for that. Uh, the, the distributed network and ledger makes sure that there's integrity of all the data, right? And it also makes sure that there's, there's non-repudiation. The non-repudiation means if a transaction happened, that transaction is distributed through all the network. Funny enough, blockchain uh, has been existed in cryptography forever. Uh, well, not forever, but a long, long time. When I was, uh, I'm 46 now, and I feel like I'm getting old. Um, but even back then, we in cryptography, in many of the algorithms I used when I was in the military, they had blockchain. So a, a blockchain is similar to a, a CRC, a cyclical redundancy check, where it, it's, it's like something spills over to the next sector. To, and if you mess up any of those segments, everything is, 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 uh, goes bad. So you can't, it's supposed to be tamper-proof. And, and we, like we use the, the terms integrity and all that stuff. Am I doing okay so far, uh, blockchain people? All right, cool, sweet, awesome. I feel like I did my homework for the first time ever in my life. So in cybersecurity, we talk a lot about the CIA triad. Uh, there's actually a triad related to blockchain, uh, and they call it a trilemma. But let's talk about this first. All right, and, and read, this, read, read that paper. It'll tell you about the trilemma. There's governance, security, and there's scalability. That's the trilemma. How do we keep it secure? How do we govern this, this digital technology, like how do we govern Bitcoin, how do we the govern Ethereum, all that, and how do we uh, make sure it's secure, right? And how does it scale? Those are, that's the trilemma. There's three things that every crypto community worries about. All right, so the CIA triad is something in cybersecurity we worry about. So one of the things that people say all the time is like, hey, we, you know, 
the blockchain is like every like the they're public and there's private blockchains. Anybody can have a blockchain. Everything's pretty much open source too, by the way. And and that's cool because people can poke holes through it, right? But in the public blockchain, like where people are exchanging money, you can actually look at the ledgers, you can actually look and see how much money, if you know somebody's address, you can actually see how much money they have uh, in, in currency. You can look at a wallet address and you can see everything in it. Now that kind of spooked me out at first. <laughs> like that's, that's kind of crazy. I gotta take my glasses off. I started wearing glasses too, folks, I'm getting old. Let me put these right here. That, that thing is like killing me, uh, the lights on my glasses. It probably was shining back into y'all face too, probably, I don't know. All right, cool, so I can see enough to push the next button though. All right, so the CIA triad is something that we talk about, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We talk about it all the time. Let's break it down because this actually kind of freaked me out. And a lot of people, it probably, it'll probably freak people out too because like definitely when it comes to NFTs, people, are, people have a lot of complaints about that and how confidential. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hopefully have some time for questions too, so y'all can tell me how crazy and stupid this, this whole talk was. I'm gonna save some time for that too. So confidentiality. So if it's a public blockchain, most of the stuff you put out there is, is, is for public information. There's people trying to do some tokens now where they're embedding tokens in a blockchain and you need some kind of private key PKI situation. So they're trying to do, there's methods that people are playing around with that you can encrypt stuff on the blockchain. In NFTs, there's these things called unlockable content. So if I, buy, if I buy an NFT, so if I bought an NFT of a conference, like if I said, hey, LastCon, LastCon might do NFTs in the future, by the way. They're gonna, LastCon sell an NFT and an unlockable content would be your, your uh, program guide here, right? And, uh, and so what's cool about the NFTs is that, that they're on the blockchain and you can use this, and there's this thing called Etherscan that you can check out. Uh, Etherscan is a good tool. Etherscan.io, I believe, is the domain. You can actually go to that domain and you can look at, you can scan wallets and you can see what's in wallets. You can also scan smart contracts and look at smart contracts. Um, smart contracts are, are freaking dope too, by the way. I thought all this stuff was fun. I thought all this stuff was a joke and not going anywhere too. By my, I was the ultimate skeptic of this stuff. But now I'm kind of converted and like, oh, this is pretty dope. And, and there's way more applications than just, uh, you know, Dogecoin or, or whatever, Shiba, the one that's hot right now. <laughs> There's a lot more applications in this stuff, and hopefully you're gonna see the security applications, and we gotta help secure this too. So you're gonna think of say, oh, snap, I can use this for that, and you're gonna say, oh, how do we secure that? So confidentiality, I, I think confidentiality is kind of like a reach right now, as far as blockchain goes. Uh, and I've seen companies, I've seen startups say, we have this blockchain technology that keeps your data uh, you know, secure and like confidence, confidential. I'm like, how, you know, I don't even understand it sometimes. But what people do, what happened is, and it's the same thing with AI and ML, people will say, people will take some kind of technology and then they'll, they'll say, we're, we're a blockchain company that does this, we're an AI company that does this, and a lot of times it's total bull crap, all right? For sure, y'all have seen that, right? All right, so confidentiality, I think it's far-fetched because these public blockchains, everything's public, and you can pretty much see what's in, in every wallet, pretty much. Integrity of the data, this is super important because integrity and non-repudiation goes hand in hand, and I do like the whole thing about blockchain as far as 100%, like, it's pretty dang good for non-repudiation and integrity of data. And that's why uh, financial institutions any kind of transactional kind of places are definitely 100% going to be using this. And 100% is going to be everywhere. 100%, without a doubt, is going to be in every bank, is going to be in every you know, uh, nationalized banking system, central banking. Everybody is going to be using blockchain for the non-repudiation. I'm confident of that. And I think that there's even legal, there's going to be some legal requirements that force everybody to do blockchain technology in the future. Like when we, when we talk about legal, when we talk about going in and doing like, a, a, you know, what like search warrants and God, the e-discovery and all this and stuff like that, there's definitely gonna be a blockchain component to that, 
all right, from the integrity of the data perspective. And then the availability of the data, you want to make sure that the data is available. Funny enough, some of these transactions, especially on Ethereum, it costs money to write to the blockchain. So sometimes you want to do a transaction, but there's this thing called a gas fee. The gas fee is how much it would cost you to do that transaction. Sometimes you can actually try to do a transaction that costs more than the value of what it's worth. It's crazy. So I, I can say, hey, I want to send you $5, but sometimes the gas fee could be high because the network is saturated. Sending you $5 could cost me 20 It's the craziest thing. It's called gas fees. Check it out. And that's, that's weird, and the Ethereum network is working on that, so the gas fees aren't so high. So that's why you have these other, uh, that's why you have a lot of transactions on other, uh, other networks as well. So gas fees is a big thing. I don't have a gas fee slide, but gas fees are how much does it cost me to do a transaction? It's just like when I go to ATM over here or whatever at Walmart and they're charging me five bucks to use their ATM. But the gas fee sometimes can be astronomical. It can be like $200 to do a transaction on Ethereum sometimes. Or $4,000. I mean, it depends on when you do it. It's crazy. But you want to, you would, people just wait till the gas fee calms down because you can see what the current gas fee is and you can do a transaction. So even though sometimes you want to transact, the reason why this is important, sometimes you want to do a transaction and you, maybe you can't afford to do it. So that, that funds in that situation, you can't move the trend. Sometimes you don't have enough money in your wallet to move stuff. So things sometimes won't be available. Um, and also, like, you want to make sure that the funds are available uh, as well. I mean, it, I think there's some availability playing blockchain, too. So here's some use cases, right? I think most receipts will be on the blockchain. You know, if you get a receipt from somewhere, like, because people do fake receipts, right? You know, people do that all the time. People go to, go to a fancy place. Um, you know, they go to a wedding, right? And then they, like, want to bring it back. Oh, I, f I lost the receipt. But they do it, like, a year later or something. <laughs> You know, people do stuff like that all the time. So we can see, like, there's a bunch of use cases to, for implementing blockchain uh, for receipts. Let's talk about smart contracts for a little bit. Because this right here, this blew my mind when I kind of fully understood what a smart contract was. Right? So smart contracts are, is code written and stored on the blockchain. So you write code on your machine, uh, and, and I'm going to give Solidity first. There's a program language called Solidity where you can write smart contracts in, and you can store that, that smart contract on the blockchain. And people can run code against that, against that, uh, against that forever. So if we wanted to, I mean, a simple application this would be, um, I, want, I want to build something that uh, is a poor man's copyright or something like that. You know a poor man's copyright? When I want to say I did something on this date, I would mail a copy of that to myself, right? Something like that. So we can create a smart contract that we upload data to, to a what we call a DAP. They call it a distributed application. It's called a DAP, D-A-P-P. Y'all going to be doing uh, vulnerability stuff on these DAPs, right? And the, the network, they call it the Web3 network is what they're calling it. Web 2.0 is what we're on now. They're calling all this new stuff Web 3. However, it's just like a Stripe integration, though, to be honest with you. I that's how I compare it. Web 3 is like a Stripe integration. There's a Web 3 JS is a popular library that people use right now to do to their building apps. In the Web 3, what it does is it interacts just like a Stripe integration. That's the best way I can describe it. So Web 3 actually can do transactions on all the different blockchains. Is it okay so far, my blockchain enthusiasts? I'm doing okay. All right, cool. So Web3 is, is, is this metaverse space, and this is how we transact on, on that, right? And what a smart contract, I would, I would write a smart contract and put it on the Ethereum network, compile it, put it there, and I can create a dApp, a distributed app that uses Web3, and it would actually, it can write that to a, a uh, persistent file share that is, 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 is uh, and the thing about the, the whole Web3 thing is that we, we write stuff forever. Um, 
So we write stuff on a file share that does not ever go away. There's a couple of different uh, things. There's this thing called IPFS, IPFS. You can write these files up there and, you, and it will put it on a blockchain that this file was written on this date. Now, what's really cool about this is that we can charge money for that service, right? And what's crazy about it is that this smart contract can work to infinity. So that means I write a smart contract right now, put it in the blockchain, and people can do transactions, and I can get paid in a cryptocurrency forever. So I get paid for it. When I go away, I leave that to my kids. They get money from this thing. So this is a way to work forever and make money forever. And it's totally decentralized. It doesn't go through no middleman or middlewoman or whatever. It just comes to your wallet. Now that right there tripped me out. I'm like, holy crap, are you kidding me? And then you can write smart contracts to do more stuff. Here's the deal. So whatever company you work for, there's going to be a reason why that they want to do a smart contract. And also there's going to be a reason why that companies will want to get paid in cryptocurrency in the future. Why would they want to get paid in cryptocurrency, Marcus? If you look at it, the, some of these cryptocurrencies are skyrocketing. Solana, right, is brand new. It's like 150 bucks right now. It's predicted to be worth 1,000 bucks. So if I'm a company and I can get that, you see uh, what, what Tesla announced like a year or so ago, I think they, they, it's kind of, kind of middle ground now, where they said, hey, we'll, you can buy Tesla and Bitcoin. Tesla gets that money, that Bitcoin appreciates, they're making money just by holding the currency. So I think that all companies are going to hold crypto in the future. Why not? Why wouldn't you do that? It's, it's, why would you put your money in a bank when you can do that? You're going to have to have money, right? But you're definitely going to, every company, if, whatever company you work for, you're going to be taking crypto and you're going to have to learn how to protect crypto and you're going to learn how to audit these smart contracts because what developers are doing, uh, Office Space, uh, y'all remember that movie Office Space where the developer was siphoning off money into, a, you know what I'm saying? That's happening right now in the crypto space. There's people, there's developers that are developing stuff and they're writing in code to dump a little bit in their wallet too. That's happening right now. So you're going to have to be able to audit the code. You can also reverse the code too. You can actually look at the code that's on, on a wallet. You can look at a code up there and you can reverse it as well. Solidity is the language that, that is written in uh, for Ethereum. Ethereum was the first one that supported the smart contracts so as we say today. Bitcoin has some scripting that you can do with Bitcoin, but, but Ethereum is the leader and in, in the innovator per se in the space, but everybody that builds on top of Ethereum can write smart contracts too. So you gotta get on this smart, you gotta understand what, what this technology is. And also it's a great way to leave something for your kids too. To, I, mean, I mean, who wouldn't wanna, you know, and also like with some of these things, when I, when I get into NFTs, the NFTs can give royalties forever. You can, you can do something now and it's gonna make royalties. So our artists in the past, and this is go for all creatives, all people to do IP, that means all the companies you work for, that company is going to be able to, to release something, and then they're going to get paid forever. So it makes everything have some kind of crazy value that never, never happened before. There's a thing called an ABI. So right now, we're always testing APIs and all that stuff. So on a smart contract, there's a concept called a, a, it's a, it's an API, really. It's, it stands for application business interface. Is that right? Am I right, people? Anybody? Okay. Um, I think that's right. So, like I said, I might say some terms. This is all bleeding edge. I'm just, I'm drinking from, I'm drinking from the freaking fire hose, and I'm trying to give y'all as much water out the, as I can on the other side. You feel me? So ABI, that means that it's a smart con, it's a smart contract. I put the smart contract on the, uh, on, on the blockchain. And then I can make function calls in another program. That's what you would use Web3 for. I make function calls to interact with that. So now 
that I can, the ABI is an API to inter, interface with the blockchain applications, right? Y'all need to know how to do that because the, you're going to be, there's bots out there right now that they scan all these ABIs and they try to find vulnerabilities or misconfigurations and they try to do something nefarious with them. That's happening right now. And these people are making millions of dollars doing this, by the way. This is like a gold rush for criminals right now. It's insane. So read up on this. That, the, the, that original PDF that I showed y'all, read it tonight, tomorrow, something like that. Solidity. Solidity is pretty interesting. Solidity is a programming language uh, for Ethereum uh, blockchain uh, smart contract development. Uh, so, so check, read up, re maybe, maybe read up on that. It's not super hard. Most of these applications, most of these smart contracts have three or four functions. So it would be relatively easy to audit them, but people go wrong all the time. For instance, like there's people that try to sell tickets or something online, right? And they do a smart contract for that. This is happening every day. You do a smart contract, you put it up on the blockchain, and you forgot to put a limit on how many tickets somebody could buy. So now you got some hacker that writes a script that, you know, it could be some like a, who's popular now? I don't even know. I mean, I'm, I'm so old now, I don't know. <laughs> Your favorite entertainer has, has a concert, you know, 10,000 tickets for sale, and because you didn't rate limit on the smart contract, all the tickets are gone, and now this dude is selling them on a secondary market. That's happening every day. And when, when your company starts trying to sell tickets online or whatever using smart contracts and blockchain and all that stuff, you want to make sure you take that into account. You need to understand, oh, Solidity has a, has a you can easily extract the, you know, the, the sender and all that. You can actually store, you can persist data in, in, as objects in the blockchain. So it has state and memory and all that stuff. It's crazy. I mean, it's, it's nuts, but you have to understand it in order to help, help with it. Am I making sense so far? Hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm not talking crazy. It runs on everybody that's part of the network computer. Like the whole, remember I said, the blockchain is everybody's, the, all these nodes, all these nodes have a copy of all the transactions and they have a copy of the code, the, the smart contract code. It can be hosted anywhere. You're right. Yeah. But, but like back in the day when we thought our friends were stupid for doing crypto mining, that's what they were doing. And, they were getting, and now, now we look, I look stupid. I'm like, God dang, this dude is a millionaire off Bitcoin. I look crazy now. But yeah, so the question was, let me repeat the question. The question was, is this happening on Amazon? Is this happening whatever? Wherever a miner exists on some of these networks, that's where the transaction happens. So what happens is, if I, if I try to do a transaction, it sends it up, one of the miners, it, it sends it up to them. The first one that comes back with the answer gets paid, right? And that's kind of how it works. So in the, what the mining is doing is, it, it, there's nonsense and there's like a lot of technical other stuff, but it's just basically, it's just the whole network makes sure that the data has integrity. That's what it does. And so what's cool about that is that there's a lot of people that, you know, some of my friends, they had graphic cards, they was doing all this mining, they made a lot, of, they're, they're making a lot of money. Um, Rust is another language. Rust is super popular right now. Uh, I never gave Rust a second look. I, I like Golang personally. But a lot of people, a lot of my friends are doing Rust. Rust is actually one of the languages that, that's pretty handy because uh, it's uh, on Solana, you can write a smart contract in Rust. Rust is a pretty proper language. Solidity is a custom language written for the Ethereum network. What's cool about this, you can write this code in a browser. Ethereum has a, it's like code, you just write it, compile it, and then you can deploy it to the blockchain all in the browser. So on a Chromebook, you don't, you don't even, on this stuff, you can have a Chromebook and totally work. You don't need no hunking machines, no crazy stuff like that. And you can, 
you can write smart contracts and, and get paid. And people are dying for these developers right now, too, by the way. If, if you're a coder, I would, be on, I would be on some Solidity, and I would be on some Rust, and I would understand how to write smart contracts. Because it's easy, though. It's, it's easy money. It's easy money. Dang, is that a dupe? All right, let's talk a little bit about this non-fungible tokens. Uh, the non-fungible token thing is kind of hilarious because there's people selling these, these JPEGs for $200,000 and such. There's one dude that sold, he did JPEGs for a year or something, and he sold it for like $18 million or something crazy like that recently. That's insane. But uh, I don't get caught up on the art. I just caught up, I just get like, okay, cool. What's the practical application of that, right? You remember this? This is the fake, the fake ID thing, right? So in the future, I believe that all our, all our identifications, all the credit cards, all the, these things will be written. I think there's gonna, they're gonna be versions of NFTs. We call them NFTs now, and we probably still call them NFT. NFT has another name called a deed. Uh, in, in, in practical life, uh, a deed, an NFT and a deed is the same thing on the blockchain. So how this is gonna work is that everything that, that every piece of identification, insurance card, anything like that, uh, like if you try to show a cop a fake insurance card or something like that, a cop's gonna be able to scan it. He's gonna be able to go to USAA or Geico's and it's gonna be like, oh, is this real or not? It's gonna be like instantaneous, boom. Like, and like, he's gonna know when the insurance was done. I got into an accident a, a while ago and the guy that I had a wreck with was trying to get insurance before the cop came. He was on the phone to an insurance provider trying to get insurance like right then and there. He, didn't, he, didn't have, he, he hit me, didn't have insurance. Uh, however, in the future, the insurance company, like, okay, what time did this happen? And this is exactly, so it's gonna be like time, everything's gonna be time stamp. It's like a freaking log, you know, and it's gonna be for good or bad. Now, one thing, uh, as far as forensic goes, I'm an ex-digital forensic. I used to do a lot of forensics. I used to teach forensics to law enforcement. Uh, yeah, so that's why I believe that some of the things you do in your day-to-day -day job as a security professional, logs and stuff, that's going to be written to some kind of blockchain somewhere, and it's going to be, be able to be submitted in court uh, better than somebody that's making up logs, you know, or ignoring logs or whatever they do. I think that's what I'm saying. There's a blockchain little sliver for a lot of stuff. Disney, this is big. All right, so big brands are going to be doing non-fungible tokens. Uh, just like they have little trinkets when you go to McDonald's and all this other stuff, there's going to be, there's going to be NFTs for everything that you, that, that, especially big brands like Disney, there's going to be NFT for everything. There's going to be a movie come out. I believe you're going to, buy, you're going to be able to buy a script from, from, from collection memorabilia purposes. You're going to be able to do anything, and you're going to have that absolute ownership. What, what, what people like about NFTs is it's a digital contract that says I own that asset. Now there may be, you know, uh, one of my favorite movies, Full Metal Jacket, uh, this is my rifle. There are many like this, but this one is mine. With NFT, you actually own, you, you can actually own it. And it's a, it's a mind bender, but it's true. And it doesn't matter what we think, the truth is, that there's people out there that believe it and they pay for it, right? Because it's in the eye of the beholder, you know? And, and, and other people believe it has value, so it's here to stay. Some of the stuff we see is not going to be existent, but people like Disney, people like Marvel, I'm a big Marvel fan, if y'all know me. I got, I, got a, I got a killer Marvel collection, I can't lie. Marvel comes out, new movie, boom, boom, boom. You're going to have people that... that uh, uh, people going on the screen pay, people going to do this, and people like, crazy people like me will pay for that stuff. And I will have a, it will be on the blockchain that Marcus owns that. And what's crazy about these NFTs, if you sell it, you can get royalties as well. So some like Disney or Marvel, they sell stuff and they can get, they can get paid every time it flips, a percentage. So if Disney releases some kind of NFT, it sells for it sells for you know a million dollars or whatever. They get they can get ten percent of that. 
So every time it's resold, they get paid too. So that's why companies are going to be doing this. You're going to get companies and brands that sell concert tickets, and every time that concert ticket is resold in, in a secondary market, they're going to get paid on that again. That's what the reality is. is. And it's not about if it makes sense or not. What makes money is what people and companies do. Definitely going to happen, 100%. So let's talk about some attacks. So quantum computing is, a, is kind of a tech. Uh, I'm going to talk about, this will make more sense after I talk about the wallets probably, so this might be misplaced. But quantum computing, the whole thing about that is that a quantum computer, supposedly, and this might happen in the future, but I'm mad skeptical, I can't lie. I'm a skeptic. So some, some person will say, well, quantum computing will be able to look at all the private keys on the blockchain and be able to do know all the I mean know all the public keys. We can we can look at the public keys and we're going to be able to reverse those. And if you have the if you have those private keys, if you have everybody private key, you can extract all their Bitcoin. Or you can extract all the Ethereum. That's the that's the attack that people are worried about. But what's cool, though, remember that trilemma that I talked about earlier and it's going to talk about in the book? The governance piece. They do find vulnerabilities in these blockchains, but they do update. They do updates. It's open source. Hey, this is a weakness here. All right, here's a new standard. Like RFPs, that's yin yang. They don't call them, they don't call them RFPs, but they're essentially RFPs. So these communities, they have mad papers that you can read for free, and you can just read the standards. The actual NFT token is a is a art. There was a there's a paper for that. There's a paper for Bitcoin. There's a paper for Ethereum. All this stuff is public, and you can read about it and be an expert at it. Somebody in here is going to be a total expert at this stuff, and you're going to be way ahead of everybody else if if you don't get on now. I think that in the next year, if you understand this stuff, you're you're going to be so much ahead of everybody else. I think it's that serious. There's a lot of fishing going on. So I'm going, to I'm going to look at a wallet, tons of phishing going on, and these are the platforms that most of this activity is happening on right now. The crypto stuff uh, is happening heavy on, on, there's crypto little, man, mad, mad, mad Russians on this, man, like, all this, this underground is going on, on, on if, so if you don't, you're not a part of these communities, you can actually get in some of these things, and there's mad speculation from a financial perspective, crazy amount of speculation. Um, Twitter, uh, and I'll, I'll explain how Twitter has a link too, because the, in the NFT space, Twitter is one of the main conduits to advertise NFTs. So there's fake, there's fake Twitter accounts popping up, and they're making, they're making millions of dollars doing this. And if, like that, every day there's an NFT collection that makes like $2.5 million. That's like standard now. It's crazy. It's happening every day. All right, let's talk about hot wallets. All right, how am I doing? I'm doing good on time. Oh, cool. All right, that, that's plenty of time. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to wrap up in about five, and then I have some questions. All right, I'll take questions. All right, cool. So hot wallet. A hot wallet is a wallet that's kind of like online. Uh, there's terms like non-custodial versus uh, custodial wallets that that you'll hear. But I just like talking about them like hot wallet, cold wallet. So hot wallet essentially is a wallet that you use for transactions. And there's a couple of different hot wallets that are very popular. I'm going to talk about the two that I deal with. But there's, there's tons of other wallets. This one is the most famous wallet right here. This is, a, this is a MetaMask wallet, right? So MetaMask allows you to do transactions on Ethereum network. And it's a Chrome extension that allows you to do Web3 transactions. The Web3 transactions is just like Stripe. It's, the, I, it's, a, it's a Stripe integration, except the integration is talking to the blockchain. So this, this, hot, this hot wallet, uh, this hot wallet allows you to exchange crypto for purchase on things, right? The Web3 the web applications that your company is going to build, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Y'all going to be building Web3 applications, and people are going to be using if, if it's on Ethereum network, because you can pick what network provider, but Web3 works on all, the, all of them, though, pretty much. Web3, the, the Java, it's a JavaScript library, uh, web, web3.js. MetaMask allows you to do those transactions. You go to the site, you can, and 
If you like what you want, if you like it, you can actually buy it with the MetaMask wallet. So the MetaMask wallet, um, when it comes up, it has this thing called a seed phrase. The seed phrase is a long, like a passphrase. It's like 24 letter, 24 words or something. And it creates this huge freaking number that serves pretty much as your private key uh, in a roundabout way. That was a technical shortcut there. You can read more about it though. It's a freaking long passphrase that creates, a, that creates your private key pretty much. That's, that's kind of how it works. Um, and so with that, uh, you, you have a public key and, and if people want to send money to you, they send, mu mu they send money to your public key and you can receive it and you can spend it with the private key. It's, it's PKI. There's another one. Uh, so this is what that, that looks like. Um, it tells you to write this down because with that, with that phrase there, what you can do, and this is what your customers are going to be doing and what you're going to do as a consumer, you're going to be able to use that to generate that private key. If, if you ever do this, do not share that with anybody except for your family, probably. Uh, most people say write it down. There's people, and if the co-wallets work just like this, there, what people do is they take half of the half, they take half of this and they put it on, they engrave it on a metal plate, and they take the other half and engrave it on a metal plate. There's people in these MetaMask wallets. It's a Chrome plugin. People have millions of dollars on this Chrome plugin. Is that crazy? And and if I see that, if you if you show somebody this, what is happening? A lot of these people aren't technical at all, so these engineers are like, hey, yeah, let's do a project together, and, and they'll do, and they're like, oh, yeah, cool, can you do a screen share so I can see the art? And as soon as they show this phrase here, they'll, they'll do social engineering to get them to reveal this, this seed phrase is what we call it. Screen capture the seed phrase and totally drain the wallet within minutes because the seed phrase creates that private key. You got the private key, you can put it in any MetaMask yourself, and you can transfer it to another wallet. I, I, I have a friend who helps people do incident response in this all the time. Every day, somebody just lost $200,000. Somebody had lost it. Like, can you imagine that? Like, you're an artist, and, and all your life worth, you've been waiting for this moment to capitalize on this. And, like, she talks to people, and they're like, I'm about to kill myself. That's serious. I was, I, I was using this, this would have paid this. She talked to somebody the other day. I, was, I just got married and I was about to buy a house with that money. And then these scammers stole it from me. This is crazy, this is the wild, wild west. This is the wild, wild west. And from a security person, I'm like, man, there's people getting affected by this. This is nuts, like, you know, cause we don't like, $200,000, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money to most people. And there's also a Phantom Wallet. Uh, I actually do a lot of stuff on Sol uh, Solana Network. Phantom Wallet is a very popular and really good wallet. Different network and all that stuff, right? Then there's a cold wallet. So, so we're talking about a hot wallet here. Another hot wallet. So essentially, it's in the browser. So a hacker, if they, if they own you, they can find the private key. Or if you start a seed phrase, they're gonna, they can get that too, and they can just put it, in, they can put it in their app, and it'll generate the same private key. So if you ever do transactions, or if you have people say, never, never share your seed phrase. Never, never share it. That's like giving people your bank account. Then there's a cold wallet. Uh, cold wallet is something that the, the private key is stored on an alternative device. So the private key is not, so it's like a little shim, per se. And this is what a cold wallet kind of looks like. This is a very popular cold wallet called Ledger. And this is what a lot of people recommend. So this wallet, you hook it up to your, you hook it up to your USB, and it maintains the private key on the, the device. So not even your computer knows the, the private key. Your, your, your computer can transact by using the public key to communicate with this device. So your private key is secret, right? But the whole deal is how blockchain works 
is everything's public as far as what's in the wallet, but people will not have your, your private key. So that's why everybody, if you're doing these transactions, uh, if your customers in the future are doing these transactions, you're going to want them to, to understand cold wallets and what a cold wallet is. And that's the best way to stay, stay protected. Now, this is kind of interesting because a lot of people will probably, probably use crypto, and, and some people have millions of dollars just sitting on a computer. If you have that, you should, you should transition to cold wallet. Most crypto people are kind of aware of this. But if you're starting to get into crypto, you want to get a cold wallet. And from an enterprise perspective, what's going to happen when you start taking crypto payments? Are y'all going to have a strategy on cold wallet at your company? I know somebody in here is probably already taking crypto payments. But how do you handle that? There's, there's creative solutions that, that people can share these things as well. So there could be multiple people with access and all that stuff. What's your CFO going to do? You know, what, what's the CFO doing, right? Who has custody of these wallets? Are you keeping them in a safe deposit box? Or, I mean, there's all kind of crazy stuff going on. Like, I mean, I can't, I'm like, how do, how do you do this? You know? And if somebody gets the seed phrase, say if, you, if your employee leaves the company, like pull, pulls a Snowden on you, and ends up in Russia, and that person has the seed phrase, guess what? That person can put that seed phrase in a device in Russia and transfer all the crypto out of, out of that, because it's on the blockchain. The crypto is, it, the, the, the calculations, should I say, the balances are actually stored on the blockchain. So from a corporate situation, how do we protect, if our companies take crypto payments, how do we protect that? There's a whole lot of money from, a, from a protecting, and if you know how to do this, and you create solutions to do this, and you help protect these things, you're going to be super valuable as a professional. So I want everybody to know this is a big problem, and if you know how to solve it or you can work in it, you're going to be able to, you know, you're going to be able to make a bag. I like people making money. You know what I'm saying? I want my friends and colleagues to get better jobs and, and be able to, you know, provide for their families and all that stuff and do good stuff. All right. So I do. So, hey, I want y'all to check out my art. And I'm actually selling art. And this is not a, a straight up plug. I'm telling you because I'm actually jumping into the NFT space. And the reason why is because I want to understand what these artists are feeling. Like, I want like, okay, cool, they're doing this big thing, they're, 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 launch, they're, they're putting their art online and they're selling it, and what the process has taught me so much, right? Just me doing this, I've learned so much. I've learned about these blockchains, I've learned about the payments, I've learned about the gas. The, everything, everything I'm telling you right now is because I'm going through this process. And that's, that's crazy. So, you never understand, you know, certain kind of things till you walk a mile in, in somebody's shoes. That's why I encourage people: if you're a security professional, learn how to do, uh, learn how to do system administration, learn how to do networking, learn how to do all that stuff. Because if you understand all those things, then you can be able to secure it better, right? I wouldn't have known anything that I'm telling you right now, because what's crazy is I'm going down this thing and I keep on seeing these security things. I'm like, holy crap, that, 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 that. And then you walk away with like, wow, we need good people fighting this good fight and trying to secure people in this way. And so I, I started this collective called Metaversible, and we're doing training and all that stuff. Right now it's a collective of cybersecurity people. We're just trying to help people understand and be secure out there. So that's it. That's it. How, Five minutes. We got five minutes. Ask me anything. It can be about this or something else. Question right here. Yeah. It could be. I thought it was. I think it's application business interface is what the term I've heard used. But ABI is essentially an API. It allows you to directly interact with the code on the blockchain. So there's function calls that you can do just like any API. 
That's an ABI. I think it's application business interface, but I could be crazy. What's up? Uh, have you heard of any like uh, gas fee attacks or people trying to back up the gas fees, uh, you know, artificially for whatever reason? I've heard of people um, DDoSing and doing all kind of nefarious activity, and I, I've I've heard of people raising the gas prices. One of the things I've seen people do is on, on smart contracts and stuff. Uh, like I said, there's bots out there. And so if you're selling, some, if you're selling a product, for instance, and, and you don't want people to bots to come buy it, what you can do is you can raise the fees on your smart contract and then you can adjust the fee when you're ready for doing business. So there's, there's all kind of, there is definitely manipulation on both sides from an attack and defense perspective. What's up? I've been using Coinbase. I'm, I mean, I, I've been using it. Uh, I've heard good things about others. Not a recommendation at all, but that's just what I've been using. I'm like super new. This space is wide open. I'm, I'm new, but just like all y'all, I'm curious and I do my research. Yeah. But I use... Yeah, Coin, yeah, Coinbase. I have I have a Google app, Google Authenticator set up on there, and all that stuff. And so, what you do, like, let me go through this real quick. So, Coinbase, you buy the crypto, and you can transfer it to your hot wallet for purchasing stuff online. That's how it works. Question right back to the back. So, so what do you got for the uh, tokens for uh, investing? Uh, <laughs> that's a trap. Are you fed? No, that was the best with you. No, I don't. No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't really invest. I mean, but like, you know, I mean, if I was, you know, I, don't, I really, I'm, I'm not an investor, so I wouldn't call myself an investor. But, um, you know, I don't want to even comment on that. <laughs> but I uh, appreciate the question, though. But I, I heard people can get in trouble for giving, you know, crypto plays. Hit me in the parking lot. <laughs> Any other questions? What's the craziest malware you've ever written? Craziest malware. The thing that I've, I've written, and I see it a lot, uh, way back in the day, I, writ, I wrote a, a JavaScript keylogger in Metasploit. And I've seen that, uh, and it, it's in Metasploit still to this day, probably. But I've seen people using that same code to do attacks on MetaMask. And I'm like, holy crap, I created a monster. So I created something that. JavaScript keylogger, it pretty much injects JavaScript into the thing, and, and it does any key, lo it key logs anything in your browser. So I'm like, wow, that's crazy that I wrote something that's been actively used for attacks. And that's the, that's the red teamer's curse, or red team developer curse. The, the API is the active feature. Why do Is it binary? Okay, good. So binary is the is the, is the ABI. It stands for binary, not not business. Oh, the, the, what is used is uh, for the and uh, what is actually you write the code in high level language, like you said, it's a bit yeah. But it's actually stored in blockchain. It's FICO for it's FICO. It's not right. like Java FICO. It's yep. FICO for uh, Ethereum VM to execute. Then you need a translation between high-level language and the, the byte That's where the CPI comes come in. Yeah, you explained it way better than I could explain it. I tried my best. <laughs> I, I think we're going to need to cut because we need to oh. set up for the speed debate. Right, so I encourage people to stay for the speed debate. It's going to be fun. And if you're on the speed debate, come up here, please. Hey, I appreciate all your time. Thanks very much for having me again.